Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. All right. Well, howdy. It's good to see you guys. Uh, it's always a blessing for my wife, Don and I, to come back here uh, and be a part of our, our family at Faithbridge. It always feels a bit like coming home, so we're really grateful to be here uh, this week and next week. Uh, if you have a Bible, I want to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 7 uh, in a moment here. If you don't have one, uh, if you don't have a Bible and want one, just put a hand up. There's folks walking around with them that would love to give you one. Uh, or if you don't have one or want one, I'll read it here in a minute. You can listen along. But while you're turning to 1 Corinthians 7, let me say, uh, by way of brief update, because a lot of people I've run into have asked kind of what's going on with you. Where do you live? Well, Donna and I live in Atlanta right now, but we will be moving next month to Washington, D.C. to begin the process of starting a new church in D.C. So uh, pray for us as we transition. Uh, We are in the process of looking for a home for ourselves and for the church Uh, there's a lot of exciting things that are in the mix that I won't talk to you about now because they're all possibility and who knows what God might do. But uh, our plan is to get settled in the district, begin community groups, small groups in the city uh, with the plan of launching a church at the beginning of the new year. And let me just say, I'm so excited about what God's doing in the midst of it. I don't know if you've been to DC very much, but one out of three people in the district are between the ages of 20 and 34. One out of three. It's a very young city. Our, our government rides on the backs of the young. And uh, to be in their midst and to preach an eternal message of Jesus Christ into such an influential, motivated crowd of young people is a wonderful way to spend our life. So we're very excited about it and appreciate all the prayer and support we've gotten uh, from our family here. So thank you. We love you. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, before we jump in, let me say this. Ken and I talked about what would be the best thing for me to do over the next two weeks, and we thought, let's talk about relationships uh, for this week and next week. And so this week, we're talking about singleness. And some of you might be thinking, why would you talk about being single uh, in a setting like this? Well, the simple reason is because, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, 45% of adults in the United States over the age of 18 are single. And so our country is increasingly more single than it's ever been before. 28% of households in our country right now are single occupant households. And so if that's not your vision of the country, I wanna reacclimate you to where you live. Uh, a good percentage of the people you live, work, and minister among uh, are single among us. So we're gonna talk about singleness this week and then marriage next week. And obviously, in that quick a time frame, we won't get to cover every nuance of the single experience or the married one. So I apologize if you have a bunch of questions that I don't answer. Sorry, that's coming. But we're going to try to run straight down the middle and get some good biblical thoughts into our mind about it. Last little caveat before I jump in too is whenever you talk about singleness, people inevitably ask the question, well, okay, are you single? And the answer is no, uh, I'm married, but here's why that's not a complete waste of our time. Uh, is number one, the text I'm about to read was written by the Apostle Paul. Much of the New Testament was. And the Apostle Paul was single his entire life. So we're reading the inspired word of God written through a single man, right? Number two is I got married uh, around age 28, which statistically is the average age young men now in the country get married, which is later than any previous generation. So uh, I got to spend a good amount of my 20s single and have experiences from that. But then three, as I've worked and lived among single people most of my life, I've pulled together focus groups about this. Uh, And so I've studied singles. So much of the way I'm going to come at this is addressing singles directly. And so if you are married, don't let that hurt your feelings. How many marriage sermons have single people had to sit through, right? Um, But... There will be some things in here for you too, so pay attention. Don't just click off duty and go, oh, all this conviction's not for me. You should listen, single person. Uh, We're coming at you too. So let's read this text together. We'll pray and then jump in. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 7, says this. I wish all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and to the widow, I say it's good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Now skip to verse uh, 32. I want you to be free from anxieties. 
The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint on you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Let me pray for us. Lord, I want to thank you for a few minutes around your word, and I pray you would help us, God, as we walk together, single and married, into the future you have for us, God. May we learn even more now of how to walk, how to walk as one. And I pray, God, particularly for those who are single, uh, God, would you give us a vision of what it looks like to leverage this season for what matters most. And so I pray uh, and ask you guys now, if you're willing, take a minute and pray for us and ask the Lord to teach all of us in this moment. And then if you would pray for me that he'd use me and I'd be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you and we trust you. Use this time and we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Christmas in my family growing up always involved a lot of travel. Uh, Christmas morning was always at mom's house. Uh, and then we would drive to Beeville, Texas, where my grandma lived, country grandma is what we called her. And then we'd head to San Antonio to visit city grandma. We called it the love triangle, driving around uh, Texas every Christmas. And the best presents were always at mom's house. It's where Santa came. Uh, country grandma, the gifts were always uh, a little weird, like uh, white sweaters with big deer on them, stuff like that. <laughs> city grandma, it got better. Toys, technology, things like that. Uh, except for one Christmas where it all got flipped on us. Because uh, I showed up at country grandma's house and she gave us a slingshot. And by that, I don't mean a little piece of wood with a rubber band on it, okay? This thing was made of titanium. Had a drop-down forearm grip for maximum leverage, surgical tubing for the string. This thing could break fence boards. It came with a package of little steel balls and on the package were pictures of the small woodland creatures they expected you to kill with this device. <laughs> so when she handed that to us, my brother and I were like, this is incredible, put the sweatshirt on, let's go. We went outside, <laughs> broke fence boards, it was amazing. So as we drove to cities, man, we were like, man, if country grandma's rolling out, city's about to take it to the next level, this is gonna be the best Christmas ever. So you imagine our surprise when we got there and she handed me an envelope and I opened it and it said, you are the proud recipient of 100 shares of stock in such and such a company. And uh, I think the adults in the room could see that uh, my little seven-year-old mind was a little less than blessed <laughs> by this. So they started to try to explain it to me. They were like, see, stock is kind of like money, but you can't spend it. But maybe later it'll be more money. And I'm like, well, we all hope so, don't we? I'm just like, what is this? It's a waste of my time. Why would she do this, right? And yet, fast forward a few years later, I was out in the backyard playing with some friends. My brother was in his room. Somehow, my slingshot ended up in his room. And as I'm playing with my buddies, uh, pennies start whizzing past us, right? And one hits my arm and cuts me, draws blood. And uh, he gets in trouble. So my mom takes the slingshot from him, so I'm all frustrated, so I go blow off some steam, I'm gonna go break some fence boards. And so I start shooting it with the slingshot, the surgical tubing breaks and whips and cuts the other arm. <laughs> so in a minute, I'm like, what is happening? Like this thing that was supposed to bring me great joy has brought me nothing but sadness and pain, right? <laughs> Fast forward several years later, and I showed up uh, to live a lifelong dream of going to seminary to study the Word of God. And I remember the first time I walked onto the campus of Dallas Seminary, I walked in and uh, there was a big table in the student center piled high with bread. And the guy that was showing me around, I was like, dude, that's amazing. I didn't know we handed out bread in the city. I love that. And he was like, hand it out? He said, no, this school is expensive, man. This bread's for uh, seminary students. Like they can't afford to eat. And literally why he's saying that all these seminary kids are like shoving bread into their backpacks and into their mouths. They're like, oh God, right? And I'm like, oh my God, like I had no idea. It was such a rough environment. And so I looked down at my financial portfolio and man, after 20 years, uh, my stock had done really well and paid for my seminary. And it just struck me, suddenly, he who was less than blessed was now singing the praises of country grandma, right? 
Now, or city grandma. Now, why do I tell you that? For this reason. What we want is not always what's best for us. And what's best, we don't always value and appreciate. Some gifts are more welcome than others. So why didn't a seven-year-old appreciate stock? Uh, ignorance at the time. Uh, but it took someone who was loving and wise to give me a gift I didn't want and fail to appreciate at the moment. Do you see it? Now, why mention that here? Because sometimes the most loving gift from God is singleness. Singleness. Now, call it a gift because Paul did, 1 Corinthians 7. He says, yet I wish all men were even as I myself am. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner, another in that. He says, it's a gift. Now, some of us, that's a gift we don't want. Like, why would you give me, why would God do that? Got you a little something. Oh, what is a singleness? Thanks, Dad. Like, why would you do that, right? And yet the truth is, if we believe God is loving and we believe he's wise, then we have to believe that what he does for us is the most loving, wise thing that could be done for us. And so we got to look at this and go, why would he do this to us? And so we got to ask that fair question. Why would God give singleness to a lot of single people I mix in with want to be married? So why give them a season of singleness when they want to be married? Uh, and Paul gives you the answer in verse 35. He says, this I say for your own benefit. He says, it's for your good. And then he says, it's not to put a restraint on you. Literally, he uses the word to throw a noose around your neck. He says, God, when he gives you a season of being single, he's not trying to hurt you. He's not trying to choke you. He's not being cruel. But there are godly purposes in it. And then he tells you what they are. He says, it is to promote what is appropriate and to secure an undistracted devotion to the Lord. Now, I want you to catch that. Every human being on the planet is going to be given by God a season of singleness. Some of us, it's longer than others. Some of us, it's shorter. But the reality is God has ordained that all of us will be single for a part of our lives. And he just told us here, why? Why? And he gave us two reasons. The first one, he says, is to promote what is appropriate. He says, I want to promote what's appropriate. And you go, what does appropriate mean? Well, an appropriate thing is something that fits an environment, right? Uh, we would call something inappropriate when it doesn't fit an environment, like wearing a swimsuit to a wedding. Are swimsuits evil? No. Wearing a swimsuit to a wedding? Inappropriate. Why? Because it doesn't fit the context. Do you see it? There's things that I could whisper to my wife in our bedroom as a married man that would be uh, appropriate, good, life-giving, right for a man to say to his wife, right? Those same sentences whispered to the people working the resource table uh, can get you arrested, right? <laughs> inappropriate. Why? Because it doesn't fit the context. And so catch this. Paul says the reason you're single is because I want to promote what is appropriate. God made you single because he wants to champion a worldview, a way of seeing things and a way of living that fits the context we are currently in. Which raises the million dollar question, what's the context? And you get it earlier in the book of 1 Corinthians. I didn't read it to you, but he says, this is what I mean, brothers, the appointed time has grown very short. So from now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. Let those who mourn as though they're not mourning. Those who rejoice as though they're not rejoicing. Those who buy as though they had no goods. Those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Now there's a lot to that I'm not going to unpack, but let me just clarify. He's not advocating ditching your spouse and quitting your job. What he is saying, though, is that singleness, dating, marriage, work, though important parts of the human experience, they are not the main storyline of your life at all. And if we just took the Bible and looked at relationships, marriage, dating, those sorts of things, there are passages in the Bible that speak to it. You get Genesis 2, you get Genesis 24, you get all of Song of Song. Solomon and much of the Proverbs. You get Ephesians 5 and Colossians, 1 Corinthians speaking to the single experience. You've got all these different places in the Bible that speak about our romantic encounters. And yet, if you were to grab them all and put them in one piece of the Bible, they're just a tiny sliver of the Word of God. Much more is written about other things. 
And some of us go, well, this is the most important thing. What are these other things? Well, the other things are the big story of what God is about. Because he says in 1 Corinthians 1, fornicators, idolaters, thieves, revilers, swindlers will not inherit the kingdom of God. And such were you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What he's saying is the world is a dark place. And every person in it has had horrible things perpetrated against us and horrible things perpetrated by us. And yet the main storyline of the world is we are all devastated because of our own choices. And yet the mercy of God is on the move. And the Son of God, Jesus Christ, has broken through the darkness. And he has come and he's forgiving people like me and like you and giving us a hope and a future and life and relationship with God. And he's beating back the darkness and he's building a kingdom of God in this world. And we get to be a part of that. And then he says, and the time is short. It's not a lot of time left on the clock. In your life and mine, our lives are brief. And in the story of all of humanity, the time is short. And so what he's saying here is when you realize that's the main storyline and there's not a lot of time left on the clock, the clock should influence how you play the game. So for me, I remember the first time I ever played Madden on a video game, right? Football. I was playing with a guy at his house on the game and I was getting crushed, right? Uh, until finally a few minutes into the game, uh, I start making some headway, right? I'm doing these little run plays up the middle, and I'm just like, Texas A&M from the 90s, just jam it up the middle, jam it up the middle, right? And I'm making about five yards every play, all right? And I'm like, dude, I'm starting to get some traction. This is going. And then all of a sudden, the game stops. And I was like, hey, man, what, ha what happened to the game? And I remember he looked over at me, and he said, you were an idiot. I was like, excuse me? And he said, the game stopped because it's over. It was the fourth quarter with two minutes left. And you had a chance to score and you were running these little five yard run plays. So that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. And I said, I didn't know how much time was on the clock. And he said, that's exactly what makes you an idiot. <laughs> now I disagree with all name calling, but the point he was making <laughs> is true. The amount of time on the clock should influence how you play the game. And this is God saying, there's not a lot of time left. And man, our relationship status matters. It matters to God a great deal. It matters to him actually more than it matters to you. And yet the main storyline of this world is about how broken we all are in sin. And you know that. Read a newspaper. But the good news is God is on the move and building a kingdom. And we need to be far more interested in the state of the souls of the people around us than their relationship status. That's the point. Is that God wants to secure a mindset that's appropriate for the context we're in. And yet a natural question would be, well, why can't I do that married? I'll sit by him in church. Why do I got to be single for God to champion that worldview? Well, that's the second thing he presents, to secure an undistracted devotion to the Lord. And there's a principle there for Paul. Dating, though it's a great thing, is distracting. I see this all the time when I speak to young people. It's happening in this room. Some of you when we were worshiping earlier, you were reading the words on the screen and you were singing along. As I read the scripture, you were reading along with me and paying attention. As I've been preaching, you've been listening and assessing my words. Right? Some of you are here sitting next to someone who's cute and maybe has some potential. Right? <laughs> and the whole time we were singing, you were like, I wonder how I look right now. Should I raise my hands? Is that a little too into it? Maybe I'll just put them here. No, that feels wrong. All right, I'm not sure. All right. Maybe I'll be like a little into it, like right here. Kind of split it both ways, right? While we were reading the scripture, you're like, should I hold mine out so they can look at it? What if my hand starts to shake? Is that weird? I don't want to do that. Oh my God. And while I was praying, you're like, did our arms just touch? Is his arm touching my arm? Oh my God, our arms touching. What does it mean, right? And the whole time we've been doing this, you've been distracted. That's why the Puritans, early in America, they used to divide the congregation. Guys would sit on one side, girls on the other, even married people. Because if you're trying to focus on the word of God next to a woman who smells fantastic, it's not easy, right? And so that's why they would do it. And the reality is it can get distracting. And so God, for all of us, creates a season of singleness for a purpose, to secure an undistracted devotion to the Lord. Why? Because we read it earlier in Colossians. All things are made by him and for him. You weren't just made by God, you were made for God. Augustine said our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. 
So when Jesus sat by the woman at the well, he began to speak to her about thirst and about quenching thirst. And then he brought it into her relational categories. And he said, you've had five husbands and you're living with a guy now that you're not married to. And then what does he do? He doesn't just condemn her or tisk her or that kind of thing. What does he do? He starts talking to her about, if you knew who was sitting with you, you would ask me and I'd give you living water that make your soul alive. Why did he bridge that? He said, you are looking for a romantic relationship to do what only God can. He says, so before you will ever get a relationship with a guy or girl right, you have to get a relationship with God right. That's why God ordains a season of singleness for us, to secure an undistracted devotion to him because our hearts will be restless until they find their rest in him. And some of you have taken that restlessness to a lot of broken cisterns and wondering why you're still thirsty. And yet let's ask the question, why do I have to be single to do that? Some of you say, married people seek the Lord together. Why make me single at this stage of my life or this long in my life in order to champion that? Well, he says in verse 32, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And I'll preach this to young men, and you can see in their eyes, they're like, Satisfy their wife, Ben, that's the kind of distraction I want to be involved in. And I tell them, probably not, man. Like, you don't understand some of the challenges you're going to take on when you get married. And I'll sit there and explain it to them. Like, look, man, you're going to get married, and all of a sudden, you're going to have to spend money on things you never thought you had to spend money on. Like, it's going to shock you that you're like, I have to buy a refrigerator? Who does that? I have to buy a washer and dryer? Oh, my God, i got to buy duvet covers? How many pillows? Is that necessary? And you're going to go through this whole process, and you're going to have to do it with her, and she's going to stand there in the store for hours and go, so which plate design do you like? Do you like this one or this one? Do you like this pattern or this pattern? This one or this one? This one? And you're like this one. And you're going to go, I... I can't care. <laughs> and suddenly you're going to be making all these decisions about home decor that for many men, not all, but many men, that is not really your sweet spot. And then you're going to have to do some small talk with all kinds of different family members and kind of mixing in with them. You're going to have vacations and holidays with people that you don't know very well that you're now related to. And you're going to have all these responsibilities come landing on you. And you're going, I'm going to have to get a second job, right, to cover all this. And then when you get home, you're gonna go, oh my God, I'm exhausted, I just wanna sit down and watch TV. No, son. <laughs> you're gonna get home and she's gonna ask you about your day in a sweeping, good, and you're gonna cut it. <laughs> she's gonna want details, details, and then she's gonna to wanna to share details. And you can't just be like, mm-hmm, okay. You're gonna to have to listen with your face and you're gonna to have to go there emotionally and go like, that would frustrate me too. I don't know what I would do if my friend said that to me. And you're gonna to have to connect with her at a level that's foreign to your friendship circles right? And I'm not downing marriage. I love being married, but the reality is there's a lot to it. So if you're single, just look around now at the married men. And now you understand why their testosterone level drops, their hair starts to fall out, and they're so tired. Is what I'm told anyway. That's what the statistics say. But ladies, it's true of you. It says, the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. And many of you ladies know this. When you get married, your husband will have expectations of you that maybe his mama did for him or something that you just didn't expect. Some people go like, oh no, we'll do the cleaning together. <laughs> but then you'll realize his standard of cleanliness is far below, <laughs> not just what's appropriate, what's sanitary? Like what's good... <laughs> for a human, you know? And then you're gonna have some pretty crazy things happen during the day and you're like, I'm gonna process it. Why don't I process it with my soulmate, the person who's supposed to love me through my days? And you're gonna explain to him some of the challenges you're dealing with and he's gonna look at you drooling and you're gonna be like, what's the matter with you? I don't understand what that face means. Like, are you listening to what I'm saying to you? And you're gonna wonder, what's the matter with this guy? I don't feel like he understands me. And let me say this, he doesn't, he doesn't. <laughs> All the movies Hollywood makes where the guy understands like, he's Ryan Gosling and he's there with you. They're written by women, right? Like the guy hasn't watched those. He doesn't know how to be that person, right? And they're going to confuse each other and frustrate each other, right? And then you add kids to the mix. Paul calls it an encumbrance. I remember when I first came here uh, to Faithbridge, 
I came to Faith Bridge as a single person. One of the greatest gifts of my life as a single person at Faith Bridge is I got married friends. You didn't have married friends before in life. But I was kicking it with some people, and they're like, hey, we're all going on a retreat. Why don't you go? And I was like, yeah, let's go. I threw my stuff in a backpack, threw it in the back of my truck, and said, let's ride. I showed up at their house, and we waited for hours <laughs> while they packed the minivan. They packed a trailer attached to the minivan with more stuff to entertain and keep their children alive. And then they were like, can we use the bed of your truck? And they started loading my truck with other like childhood accoutrements. And I was like, this is insane. I was like, your life is so encumbered. I was like, I can go to Starbucks now. I don't have to ask anybody. I don't have to be like, hey babe, all the guys are going out. Do you mind? I was like, I just realized I have more freedom and discretionary time than any of these married people. And it's interesting being on the other side of it now. I was visiting with one of my staff members the other day and she was asking me, have you seen this show? No. Have you seen this show? No. Have you seen this show? No. She's like, how have you never seen these shows? And I looked at her and I said, I have three kids under the age of five. I have 30 minutes of discretionary time every day where I do what I want. And she went, I have six hours. And I said, I know. I know. I said, I've been there. And, uh, and I'm so tired now, so tired, <laughs> right? Now, am I down on marriage? No, I'm trying to have fun here, but I'm trying to illustrate a point. And the point is this, for all of us, whatever stage you're in, what we tend to do as human beings is we tend to downplay the advantages of our stage and we begin to up the frustrations of our stage, right? And I don't want you to miss the advantages of being single because you're pining away for the next stage. The advantage of singleness is freedom and time. Freedom and time. No other person in life has the amount of freedom or time that a single person does. And it's not to fill with distractions. It is to pursue an undistracted devotion to the Lord. That's what it's for, right? And so the reality is, if these verses, the unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, the unmarried woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy, if that doesn't define your single experience, then singleness will be very frustrating right? because you're missing what it's for. It's to pursue an undistracted devotion to the Lord. And the most satisfied single people I've ever known are the people who get that. So when I first got here at Faithbridge, I was a youth pastor here for years, single guy, living in the suburbs. I started taking some seminary classes at night. And I remember being in there and there was a guy sat next to in class, cool guy. And over and over again in this class, we would always be asked, so what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? And I was like, I'm a youth pastor and everyone expected that. He would say, uh, well, I sell steel to make a living. He said, but what I really live for are the high school kids that I mentor uh, through Young Life. And then he would just start talking about these kids. And I remember sitting next to him in class and I'm like, everyone expects me to be here. I'm like this guy is young, single, living in the city. He could be going out every night. He could be sitting at home every night, but he's taken what has been given to him being single and he is leveraging it to influence in the people behind him in a generation and to dedicate a night a week to take a class to learn about the life of Jesus. And I'm like, this guy is leveraging singleness well. He's killing it, right? We have more freedom and time in that season than we'll ever have before. So when I came here to Faith Bridge, I was very frustrated uh, early on, single in the suburbs. I was like, I'm the only guy here at Faith Bridge that was single because there's only like seven people at Faith Bridge at this time. There wasn't a lot of them. And uh, I was like, this is crazy, right? And uh, I was number seven. Yeah, I was like, dude, you know, I'm just kidding. But uh, I remember at one point, youth ministry started to grow. We started to see more people come and more people come. And I remember at one moment, I was in the back hallway at Cleb trying to prepare a sermon. And one of my little junior high guys walked by. And I knew that his parents had recently gotten a divorce. And I asked him, how you doing, man? And he said, I'm good. I'm fine. And I said, what were you up to this weekend? He's like, well, I was helping my dad move in. His dad was moving in uh, with his girlfriend downtown. And I said, how'd that go? And he said, it's fine. It was fine. And I remember in that moment, I, I put my stuff down. And I don't normally talk like this to kids, but I, but I looked at him and I said, hey, man, I know you're going to be fine because God's got you and he loves you. I said, but this whole thing sucks. And it's okay to say it sucks. And he just burst out crying. 
and he fell into my arms. And I remember holding this guy and I thought about all that I had thought I lost by being single in the suburbs here in spring. But as I intersected this kid, it struck me, he's got nobody to talk to. No other 12-year-olds are helping him process this. His parents are not in a position where either of them are helping him in his scenario very much either. And I remember holding this kid and thanking God that God allowed me to leverage this season of my life to influence these young people. And the student ministry here at Faithbridge was built in large part on the efforts of single people and not just 20-something singles. My best ones were singles later in life. Adam named a crap ton of animals before Eve came along. (laughs) You can get a lot done when you're single. (laughs) And I would challenge you to do it. I would challenge you to do it. And listen to me, this isn't just on singles. The average American in our country today spends 7.5 hours looking at a screen. We do. Uh, The average gamer in America today is over the age of 30. So if you think of video gamers as little kids, it's not. It's primarily adults on their phones, right? And I'm not going to rip on you for playing video games. You play your Candy Crush and have a blast. I don't care. But I would encourage you to track how many hours you do, and I would challenge you, don't spend your whole life solving little problems on a screen when the real world is on fire. There's so much pain in this world, so much. We are right now in the midst of the largest humanitarian crisis since World War II, and some of you don't even know what I'm talking about right now. But it's the biggest human aid crisis in decades. We need to know, and we sure as heck need to care. And so here in the midst of this, God has dedicated some of you to a season of singleness. And I don't want to downplay the struggles of that. I really don't. But I want to challenge you to embrace the upsides of it. That word devotion in Greek is the combination of two words, the word good and the word beside. I'm going to be really good at being beside the Lord. A great translation would be the word attentive because it gathers the two kind of pieces of what that means. Think of a waiter. A good waiter's attentive. What does that mean? It means two things. He's attentive to your word, that he's listening to the things you say, and he's attentive to the work. He's going to do what you desire. And that's what we're meant to do with all of our lives, but especially single people, you have greater freedom to do this, that we are attentive to the word of God and we are attentive to the work of God. That would be a great way to leverage your singleness. Attentive to the word of God. Set your mind on things above, is what the Bible will say. For me, I realized I had so much discretionary time when I got here through my 20s when I was single, and I realized I was spending a lot of it in front of a TV, and I thought, when I die, I don't want that to be true of me. But I realized I'd been a Christian for years and never read the Bible. I was like, I probably, if I think these are the very words of God spoken to me, I should probably look into what they are. So for a season of my life, I got rid of my TV. I just couldn't, for me at that time of my life, I couldn't have like a healthy control of it. I was like, it's all or nothing. So I kicked it out of my house and I would write out books of the Bible just so I could get them into me. And some of you, God may call you to that. I decided to co-opt my time in the car where I would just like sing half a song And just go, you know, I could do something way more beneficial with that. And I began to listen to sermons. Much of what I preach now, people were like, I can tell you've been to seminary. And I was like, this didn't come from seminary, bro. This came from the hours when I was single and I sat alone with God. There are coffee shops all over Spring, Texas, (laughs) where I read through the Bible over and over, getting to know and fall in love with God. And the fruits of that singleness uh, have been what I've experienced through much of the last decade of ministry for me. The seeds planted there have come to fruition. And so as Ken was challenging us to enter a season of reading God's word, take that seriously. Get it deep into you. Get great at that relationship with God. And then I would say be attentive to his work, serving people, loving people, getting involved in what God is doing. Man, for me, I remember at Breakaway, we would always pick a project every year, something that was heavy on our hearts. And the refugee crisis was a major issue for us. Wherever you land politically on what should happen, the reality is nobody wants kids to starve to death, and they were overseas, and we wanted to do something about it. And so the reality is we found some organizations that could provide aid to refugees overseas, and we're like, we want to be a part of that solution. And I had three single people that were working with me. One of them was in design, one of them did all the research, and one made the videos. And these people put all the effort into it, and I just stood up on stage and championed what they were doing, but they raised a quarter of a million dollars 
using their creativity, using their gifts, a quarter of a million dollars. So whatever else is true of their life, they can say, when I was single and the world lit on fire, I was there to make a difference. And you want a life like that. I remember at Breakaway, early on, there was a girl that came up to me, and this was a common thing for students to do. She would say, hey, I visited a place in Africa. There's some people there that are willing to take on these kids and take care of them, but they need a house. I want to build an orphanage, and I think you should do it. And that was a common thing for people to do. They'd get a burden in their heart, a vision in their heart, and they would walk up to me and say, here, you do it. And so I told her what I told a lot of young people. I said, you're not the first person who asked me to do something this week. I average about 10 a week. I said, so the truth is, we have something God's put on our heart to put money towards. I said, I think God's put it on your heart because he wants you to do it. And I said, I know that feels overwhelming because you're like, I don't have any money. How am I going to do that? And I said, but that's where faith grows when you feel overwhelmed and have to trust God and then leverage the networks he's given you and see what God does. And she walked away and I'm like, everyone hates when I say that. So she didn't walk away like, thank you, pastor. I mean, it was kind of like, well, that probably didn't go great. But uh, a year later, she came back, young girl. She came back and said, hey, you told me to update you and so I wanted to let you know what happened. I said, what happened? She's like, well, we built it. I said, but what? She's like, we built an orphanage. Yeah, we got it, it's done. There's kids living there. I said, what do you mean we built it? Who's we? She's like, my roommates. Like the four of us built it. I was like, how did you do that? And she's like, well, we raised the five figures it took to build the house. I'm like, where did you get that money? She said, bracelets. She's like, what? She's like, bracelets. We made bracelets and we sold them. And the bracelets made over $50,000 and we built an orphanage. And I was like, that is a good way to leverage singleness. You sweet girl are what I'm talking about. Imagine if the people of God decided to live like that. Imagine if we looked at our own time and money that way to say the time is short, so I will leverage what I have for what matters most. That's a beautiful way to spend your single season. Last thing I want to say is this to answer on singleness. Is it more spiritual? Because Paul seems to say so. He says, I think it's good for you to remain as I am. Paul stayed single his whole life. And he said, if you're single, I think it's good to remain like I am. He says, but if you don't have self-control, let him marry. Some of you heard that part and you're like, I'm on fire. Bring on the spouse. Let's go. But others of you, and I talk to a lot of people that are single and they go, if it's more spiritual to be single, then do I just need to accept that and always do that? And that's a real question. And I want to answer it quickly in Matthew 19. Jesus is speaking and he says, there are eunuchs, and I don't have time to explain what a eunuch is. You can ask Ken later. <laughs> but um, anyway, it's someone who's not having kids. And he says, there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb. There are eunuchs who were made into eunuchs by other men, which is a very unfortunate category. And there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who's able to accept it, let him accept it. And so you read that and he goes, there are people who chose a life of having no kids and a life of no marriage for the sake of the kingdom of God. And some of you are like, should I do that? Is God asking me to do that? And the answer is, I don't know. Because Jesus will say later, and he said to them, not all men can accept this statement, but only to those to whom it has been given. And what he means by that is everybody is going to be given a season of singleness. And you might have spent years great, you might have spent it poorly, I don't know. But some of us are in the middle of it, and it is for an undistracted devotion to the Lord. That's what it's for. And yet for some of us, that season will tarry and the God who gives you that gift will give you the grace to live in it. He says some of them, it will be given to them and they can accept it. it. It will be something that God provides them the grace to live with that gift. And some of you, God will do that. And I have friends like that. Others of you, you long desperately to get married. And statistically, it's likely that you will for many of you. I don't know. But what I do know is God is good and he is loving and he is wise. And the main storyline is the relationship built to God through Jesus Christ. And in the history of the church, the single apostle Paul and the married apostle Peter joined hands and they provided the foundation of this church together. And as we live as a church, the single among us and the married among us are meant to join hands and build this thing together. We already are. And if you're not aware of that, I would challenge you, man, get to know the people in different stages of life. We're meant to be a gift to one another with the different gifts we have in our seasons of life. The greatest gift I got at Faith Bridge as a single person were all the married people that welcomed me into their homes. Never forgot that. 
Some of them might still hang out at their house. So, uh, so let's walk together for the glory of God. Amen? Let me pray for us. Lord, I want to thank you that you are not callous to the hurts in our heart. And there's so many hurts I didn't address at all. The loss of a spouse, divorce, a season of singleness that's tarried much longer than we wanted. And I don't want to be callous to any of that. So, Lord, if it's felt that way, I just pray that that would not stay in anybody's heart. God, I pray at the end, all of us, whatever season we're in, we trust you more in it believing you are the sovereign Lord over our lives. So if you've ordained us to be married right now, which how do you know if you are? Because you're married right now. Then we fight for that marriage to be a marriage that glorifies you. And if we're single, God, we fight for our singleness to be leveraged for you. So God, whatever needs to drop out of our life, let it fall. Whatever free time needs to be reorganized, may we reorganize it whatever dedication of time and money and resources that has just been funneled into selfishness, may it be funneled into a selfless love for the world. And God, I pray whatever stage we're in, single or married, when that stage ends for us, we could look up and say, I leveraged that season well. I lived for what mattered most, the glory of God in the lives of men and women. And Lord, I pray for any this morning that have never put their faith in Christ. God, long before we need to get a relationship with a guy or a girl, right? We need to get a relationship with God, right? And so, Lord, whoever, maybe they thought religion was be a good person. If that's you, you can pray even now and say, God, if you sent Jesus Christ to get me, if he's the bridegroom, the husband, marrying his bride, the church, if he's the forgiver, if he's the healer, the restorer, the one who brings me into the family of God so I can have God as a father, then I want in. And if that's you, you can pray that even now. Say, I want in. I I want to belong to him. And you get to start the best relationship you will ever enter. And then, God, for those of us who know you, may we live our lives for what matters most. God, your glory and the good of those around us. And may we link arms together, God, and see our communities change because the married and single love each other and the world so well. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Pastor Ben Stewart, Bible teacher, who just brought us a message about singleness. Welcome, Ben. Thank you. So good to have you back. Good to be here. Yeah, it's awesome. And so yeah. you have a new book coming out. And yeah. we are getting uh, some of your information from there, your singleness. And next week we're going to talk about marriage. Yeah. Um, and so whenever you talk about singleness, questions are always come up. Just okay. like I'm sure, sure we'll have some next week about marriage. Uh, but let sure. me jump yeah. into one here. Um, you talked about, and what I, what I took away from the sermon for me, was talking about how we just have this tendency of minimizing the benefits of the current Mm. season that we're in, looking at the next one. And I can certainly relate to that with small children at home. I think, gosh, they grow up and have all this time. I can't wait till Um, And so uh, one of the questions that came around that was kind of questioning this benefit of singleness. Mm -hmm. Um, The one who wrote in, their dad is a single dad, but Mm -hmm. he has four kids Mm -hmm. and he is working 14 hours a day. So he is a, he is single in the Mm -hmm. sense that we're talking about in terms um, of today, but a single dad, which is a unique season as well. Um, Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me about um, that season? What advice you would have for him? And you said um, like four kids in the home? Four kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's your calling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. and there are, um, I don't know all the ins and outs of what's happening Mm -hmm. maritally there. So I can't speak to that. But um, if you're in a situation, either dad or mom, where you're raising children alone, that will be your primary mission field Mm -hmm. and ministry zone. And that is not something to feel guilty about. And yeah, a lot of this sermon doesn't, didn't necessarily aim at that zone. And that was mm-hmm. kind of what I was trying to say at the beginning of going, this isn't going to hit a lot of the, 
of people's situations. And this would be one where you go, yeah, you're not free to go to a mm. mission trip here or there, but your mission is right in your house. Mm. It's these kids that um, every free moment you got, you leverage to speak into their life. No one will have a louder voice into the lives of those kids mm. than you. Other people might have more frequent voices, but the voice of our fathers uh, tend to linger long. Mm. And, and so if you're their dad, you creating as much space as possible to listen to them, take them out, drive in the car and talk and hear their heart and to speak honestly to them, your heart, bring them into the family of God. One of the best things my mom did as a single mom raising us was she just put us in the orbit of godly people. Mm -hmm. And as I look back on my life, there were, there was not like some guy, like my mom never remarried, but there were different men at different seasons of my life that mm -hmm. um, took us fishing, started a Bible study with me and my friends, took me on a mission trip, mentored me, took me to a father-son camp. Mm -hmm. You know, there were different men that filled that role. And that's what the church does, the body of Christ. Yeah. We step into that. And so there are people that can do that. And that may not mean you have a new romantic relationship in the near future or wife, but there are families here that can mm -hmm. mother Community your kids for, and care yeah. for your children and for you. And mm -hmm. so I would say press into the family of God and then set your gaze on I'm to seek the Lord with that time that would have been with my wife. That's the time with the Lord. And, and these kids are my mission field. And if you lead them to him, he's going to take care of you. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot more to say. Yeah. About that. And I love how you talked about the end, about locking hands together, single, married, yeah. moving the mission of Jesus forward. That's why the church is here. It's why Faith Bridge exists, is to come around families and singles and for all of us to yeah. Um, support each other. And Absolutely. So, yeah. Well, and I look back at, you know, the story I told of myself as a 20 something year old person getting to really invest heavily in the lives of a lot of our students came, were in divorced homes, single parent homes. And uh, I go, I didn't think of it this clearly till I got there. I'm like, this is what men did for me. Mm -hmm. And now I'm getting to do it for these kids. And I'd have these single parents come and we're so grateful and like, I can't understand why you'd even do that. I'm like, well, a, an allegiance to the Lord leads you to people. Mm -hmm. It always does. Um, but then I look back and go, they did it for me and I'm going to do it for them. And there are people that will love your kids and help you. And, uh, and then I think you'll keep doing that and help others too. That's good. Uh, the other question that came around, um, you talked about, um, just what's happening in the world, you put it in the way of the world is on fire. And mm -hmm. it is. Watch the news. Yeah. It's sad. Uh, so this question is that wanted to know, you talked about the largest humanitarian crisis now. What were you speaking of? Yeah, well, I was quoting the UN. You know, they're talking about in the Middle East and North Africa, the issue of starvation, mm -hmm. that 20 million people are starving right now and really localized in four countries. And some of it is, you know, issues with um, the weather, but most of it is issues with extremism mm -hmm. and people being forced to flee. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are Christians that are having to mm -hmm. flee hostile areas, but a lot of them aren't Christians. They're just people that are in a war-torn city and fleeing, and they don't get to pack up and flee. And so you've got millions of people that literally do not know where the next meal will come from. Mm -hmm. And... Um, like I said, it's become a political issue in the States. Refugees kickstarts this whole political conversation for people. But you go, look, overseas right now, there's millions of people wandering and without food. And there's children starving to death. And I think we can all agree children starving to death isn't a solution of any kind. And so there's some amazing ministries and organizations all around the world that are first responding to come and help people in need. And I just think if you can look at... Um, the hurts in the world, we, we, we have to be compelled there. Jesus moves among the poor and the hurting, and there's millions of them right now. So the UN speaking to it, there's a lot of ministries that you can get involved in that would point towards it. I'm sure Faith Bridge is behind some of them. Yeah, we are. Yeah, and I would really encourage people to, to care and do something. That's good. Uh, well, thank you for being back with us. It's yeah. always a pleasure to have you. Thanks. And uh, looking forward to your message next week Mary's as we hit marriage. Week. Here we Come go. On. Don't miss it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll see you back here next week. 
Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.